So specific to the Bell uh, in theatre field mods, uh, what have we got going on there? And um, I can already see one of them from here. Yes, uh, and there were several field modifications, and we're looking at what I would argue is probably the most important one, mm -hmm. and that's these uh, 50 caliber machine guns in the nose. Those holes existed for 30 caliber machine guns, and that's what the Bell came over with. Really? But those 30s were so useless. Uh, being small caliber that, that oftentimes the crews didn't even carry them. Hmm. And the Germans figured out pretty quickly that there was a cone in the front that was not covered well by the other guns and so they started doing these head-on attacks. Now that 30 caliber nose, is that a across the board ENF? It is, yes. Okay. So the, the 30s could sit in the plexi and the recoil was not so great that it would destroy the plexi. Oh. Well 50s you can't just stick a 50 in yeah. the plexi, it would crack and break the yeah, plexi. Okay. So there were any number of ways that they modified airplanes to get 50s in the nose. What we're looking mm. at is one of them. Mm. Now this particular mod used something that they called spiders, and all they are is it's just reinforcements that attach to the formers on the airplane and reinforce that mount so that 50s could be put in there. There are 200 of these kits made at a place called Langford Lodge and uh, they were shipped to Bassingbourne, um, and the Memphis Bell got these modifications actually later in its tour. Most of its tour didn't have these 50 caliber machine really? guns. And then it's displayed to be as impressive as possible, but typically they would only carry one of these guns in the front, because with two, you can't, only one person is operating the guns, yeah. and you can't swing them even if there were two people, because the navigator would cover the cheek guns, and the bombardier would cover one of those machine guns in the nose and and to just show how it was you know do what you can with what you have mm -hmm. they typically would carry the gun on the left hand side as you're facing forward so you have this opening on the right hand side well one might think you'd have some kind of special cap or whatever well when you look in the outtakes the way that they dealt with that was just take this big blue rag and just stick it in there and jam up that hole uh, they used a rag to jab up the open hole. Good, it worked. Huh. But that was very important getting these guns in the front to try and offset those devastating nose attack by the Germans. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, the, the, the real solution came with the B-17G and the custom chin turret that, okay. that we see on that model. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, those two guns out of the nose like that, that is not a factory F-6. Nope. That's it was done in theater. Okay. Now that was done uh, with kits from Langford Lodge that were manufactured in theater. Mm -hmm. On some other airplanes, we see very crude mountings that were done at the airfields. Um, uh, so that's a little more sophisticated than what we see on some other airplanes at the time. Um, and those guns at the front, are they fed off a of feed chute or they have the Type Zero, the little can? Um, they, these ones would typically have the can, ammo cans. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, speaking, actually speaking of ammo cans, that was a real issue because those ammo, um, ammo cans would hold about 100 rounds. Mm -hmm. um, that's what was on the waste guns. Yeah. That was a real problem because you mm -hmm. go through 100 rounds in a heartbeat. Yeah. So the Memphis Bell got another field mod and this one was done at Bassingbourne. And what this field mod was, they took, uh, they fabricated these ridiculous stands, very crude stands out of steel. Mm -hmm. And then they took the 500 round ammo cans that one would find in the tail gun position, mm -hmm. mounted them on top of these ridiculously crude mounts, and then used flexible ammo feed to the waste guns. Huh. So the Memphis Bell had this field modification. So instead of 100 rounds with an ammo, uh, uh, ammo can that's clipped to the gun, yeah. now you have 500 rounds. And what's kind of funny is that the crews, the leadership of the 8th Air Force were not authorized by the Army Air Forces to make any modifications to the airplanes without approval from right field here in the United States. Well, they're in the middle of combat, they're losing airplanes left and right, yeah. you know, what are they going to do? Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> Send me to war? Yep. So what's funny is going through the documentation, the thousands and thousands of pages that are in 8th Air Force Service Command, which had responsibility for modifications, there was a letter a memo that was done after the fact by authorities that approved this modification long after they had been put on the airplanes. Wow. But it's a good example of, you know, 
the creativity, ingenuity of the ground crews, the air crews to try and figure out, okay, what can we do yeah. with the, what we have at hand mm -hmm. to try and be more effective and maybe more of us can survive, you know, survive yeah. a 25 mission tour. It's one of the elements that made the Memphis Bell Restoration so enjoyable and so unbelievably frustrating is that there was no rationalized modification program on, in place. So that means these modifications are being done sometimes without drawings, without record, airplanes get shot down, so there's just nothing in the paperwork yeah. other than a few memos, no, you know, no drawings to build things from, which also speaks to the talent of the restoration crews that they fabricated these things from photos, yeah. a lot of what we see, yeah. uh, and what was evident on the, on the airplane. But then they rationalized the modification program just as the bell was coming back to the United States. So all of a sudden, we see in the documentation in the archives, we see drawings, we, well, that's useless for this. Mm -hmm. But importantly, you know, we see uh, ammo cans fixed, uh, uh, ammo um, receptacles in the waste gun on the G models. Well, part of that is because they also were flowing this information back to the United States. Mm -hmm. So this combat experience and some of these modifications, that information was sent back, that was filtered through the manufacturers so there were changes made eventually on the assembly lines to take advantage of that mm. combat experience that was that was really paid for in blood mm -hmm. to learn. But those modifications began in the field. They did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we get asked a lot of the times uh, some external components. Uh, what is this a dome here? So this is a, this is a fairing for what's called a DF loop or direction finding loop. Mm. And uh, this was uh, standard equipment for B-17s and other aircraft. In fact, that technology had been around for some time. Earlier aircraft, we easily recognize the DF loops because it's an open loop um, that's on a stand. And basically, uh, DF or direction finding loops, you can turn that towards an emitter, a radio emitter, and you would know exactly where that emitter is coming from. Mm. So on a lot of airplanes that's exposed, um, in the case of the B-17 and many other aircraft at the time as well, they encase that inside this aerodynamic fairing just to reduce some of the drag. Okay. Now, this location didn't work on the later B-17G because there was a chin turret on it, so they just simply moved the DF loop and the fairing back maybe about 15 feet or so on the fuselage. Okay. Um, and this black... Uh extension looking post here what is that yeah so that's an antenna that's called a standard beam approach antenna and actually that is something the memphis bell got in the uk that's not factory and it wasn't on the airplane when it was in the united states it's actually a british system hmm. and it was based uh, on an original german system called the lorenz system and that's an antenna and what it does is at airfields uh, they had a uh, uh, radio broadcasting and when the airplane lined up on the runway, they would get a steady beam, a, 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 a beam that they would hear, just a, a constant tone. If they were a little bit to the left, they would hear dots, dot, 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 dot. If they were too far to the right, they would get dashes, dash, dash, dash. And when they were right on line, those would overlap and it would be a steady beam. If they were a little bit off, they would hear that steady home, tone, but here, dash, dash on top of it. And also this system had uh, two other beams that when they were about, maybe about close to two miles out, they would get um, a long tone, uh, a dash, so they would know they're about two miles out from the runway. And then about 50 yards from the end of the runway, they would get dots. So it was a, it was a way to get lined up on a runway and uh, get an airplane down in fog. Now they would have to eventually at some point get visual reference to be able to actually land, mm. but it would get them on the right glide path and they would know that they were lined up. I mean, it's a very effective system. Um, these were retrofitted to some B-17s and some B-24s in the 8th Air Force. That was my next question. So not uh, across the board issue, it was sporadically some B-17s got it, some didn't. That's right. And, and you know, in this case, this is, it's just fantastic. Um, this is not an original SBA antenna, mm -hmm. but it was built by the restoration staff from original British drawings. Wow. So it's built to those specs. Now, of course, with the British, the RAF flying at night, 
they really needed this yeah. kind of a system. Yeah. Um, less so for the 8th Air Force, but you know, sometimes the, um, the runways were fogged in when they came back or you know, there was weather. Mm -hmm. so, but, but definitely not universally installed to all bombers in the 8th Air Force. One of the first things you kind of notice looking at the bell is this like cushion thing and it looks at first glance someone's just thrown it in there yeah. but there's a story to it. So that was one of those things that we don't really know why it's there. Mm -hmm. um, when you're watching the video footage from Weiler of the Memphis Bell taxiing and all that and any mm -hmm. photographs you'll, you'll see that in the pictures and you'll see the crew members down there and they're kind of leaning on it. Mm -hmm. So that's an item that we recreated off of the photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if it's a lid off of a box, so if it's wood or if it's some type of armor plating that they put in there, mm -hmm. but it just has a, a cotton fabric wrapped around it and taped around yeah. the edges of it to make it kind of soft. Mm -hmm. Then one other little detail that you can see from this side, there's a 50 caliber uh, shell casing. So yeah. we put that in there as well. That's okay. in the photographs. You see it there in several different time periods that it, they were shooting the guns and it obviously got yeah. stuck right there and stayed. So we recreated that as well. Is it fixed there or you just pick it off? It, the plate is just uh, setting there. It's not fixed or anything. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Zach had a really good theory. He thought when the bombardier is running the side, he could, it was like a it, armor plate. Could be, yeah. yeah. Okay. In terms of armament, um, we've got four 50s in the nose here, specific uh -huh. to the bell, and we talked about that uh, spider uh, field modification. But uh, he's got two separate guns here. I would imagine it's quite difficult to use both of them at the same time. So Yeah, he would normally use one, um, uh, just depending on which direction he needed to fire in. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, uh, there was only one gun in the B-17 nose. The cheek turrets are modifications, both the navigator's uh, guns, and they actually cut uh, pieces of the skin away to create the, uh, the holes for those guns to go in. Okay. There's photos of, uh, of uh, female factory workers with a chisel, chiseling out that area for that gun. So you got the little blister windows, mm -hmm. but you can actually kind of tell where they it's quite obvious where it used to be just skin. So yeah. prior to this modification, were there guns in the nose at all? Yeah, there was one in the front. Okay. Um, and the second one in the nose, I believe, is also a modification. Yeah. So here we are at the back of the waist guns. And these here are actually um, feed system shoots. Uh, correction. These here are feed system boxes from another B-17 tail gun position. And the reason in the turrets they didn't use that can is because they can't reach them. The guns are hard up against the edge of the turret. Um, even loading it um, manually through a feed chute is difficult because most of the time you can't even get the feed, co uh, feed cover up high enough to get in there. So hand loading weapons in the turrets is difficult. Um, so to alleviate that constant um, single can changing, uh, the turrets were equipped with a large capacity uh, ammo can and then you can actually parallel link these and have if you needed to or you were authorized to have several of these banked up and feed into the next. Now the Memphis Bell modification um, these guys obviously saw the issue of uh, that ammunition changing system so they went to another B-17 perhaps a crashed one or one they could pull parts from and took the two tail gun feed systems and then they crudely welded uh, this steel bracket in position here to keep them up level with the gun. Uh, another reason why your feed system uh, has to be as close to the gun as possible is um, the longer a belt actually has to travel, the harder the feed paws are working to pull the belt into the gun. So if you were to sit these all the way up, uh, correction, if you were to sit these all the way down on the ground and that gun's fighting to pull that belt um, up even two or three feet, it would work, but it would put a lot of strain on the belt and increase your chance of stoppage. So by raising the, uh, the feed system and then moving it as close to the gun as possible without hindering his ability to traverse forward, um, he's now got a feed shoot, direct feed into that gun. So these guys were able to use uh, their initiative and basically do what they needed to do to increase their chances of survivability. So a really cool um, example of guys in field without authorization, without approval, doing whatever they wanted to do um, to get the job done. 
and uh, the guys we talked about, um, the Memphis Bell, because this is so crudely welded and, and cut, um, it's definitely scrap steel of some kind. Uh, they were unsure that um, this was even in the Memphis Bell. Um, and it wasn't until one of the staff during the restoration saw um, really good clean footage uh, from the William Wyler film of uh, this in the film. And that basically answered the question of the debate they had as to whether or not these were actually installed in the aircraft. So it wasn't a, uh, a hillbilly post-war fix or some kind of war bonds to amount. This was done uh, in theater specifically for the gun system. So. Uh, one of the best examples in one of the most important aircraft of uh, soldiers or airmen doing what they needed to do uh, to survive.